Good morning, Stony Creek family. We're glad to have you at Church Online again this morning. As we prepare to worship in song, I just wanted to encourage you with um, some words from 1 Corinthians 15. It says this, What I am saying, brothers and sisters, is this, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor can corruption inherit incorruption. Listen, I am telling you a mystery. We will not all fall asleep, but we will all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we will be changed. For this corruptible body must be clothed with incorruptibility, and this mortal body must be clothed with immortality. When this corruptible body is clothed with incorruptibility, and this mortal body is clothed with immortality, then the saying that is written will take place. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where death is your victory? Where death is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. I hope you'll sing with us. There's a reason why the curse of sin is broken. There's a reason why the darkness runs from light. There's a reason why we stand here now forgiven. Jesus is alive. There's a reason why we are not overtaken. There's a reason why we sing on through the
Uh, church family. Uh, I am joined with Barney and Adelia Robison. Uh, they uh, served as member missionaries as a part of our church for many years. Uh, in, they served in the Gambia uh, and so why we had the fire going in August because Barney was getting a little bit cold so we had to turn that on and so uh, Venez, I'm glad that you guys are, are joined uh, uh, with us this morning. Uh, you guys have recently uh, retired um, or, or soon to retire. You'll, you'll 
uh, and are, are in London now, but moving out east in a couple of weeks. And so uh, we want you to know that we're going to miss you as a church family. We, we love you guys, and uh, this will be your last Sunday joining with us. And so we wanted a time where, where we could just hear a little bit of how God has been working in your lives and, and what God will be doing in, in your future lives. And so I do have a few questions for you. Just uh, do it to let me know and let our people know uh, what God has done and what he's going to continue to do. And so first, um, uh, if you could each let me know uh, how you came to know Christ as your Savior. Uh, and Barney, you're going to go first? Yeah, okay. I'll go first. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you, Andy. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here with you this morning. And uh, we want to uh, extend our, our thanks uh, to Stony Creek uh, Baptist Church for their faithful support these many years that we've uh, been in the Gambia in West Africa. And uh, we really uh, appreciate uh, uh, all that they have uh, done for us and been for us. And uh, as we are looking uh, to move, uh, we want to people know that uh, we will miss them. And uh, but they're very thankful for their part that they have had in our ministry. Um, I'm originally from Alberta, Lethbridge, Alberta, and uh, it was as a child when I was about eight years old uh, that I uh, came to know Jesus as my Savior. Uh, I went away uh, uh, that one summer uh, to a church camp and um, remember very distinctly uh, going forward at the invitation and, and just committing my life uh, to Jesus and uh, to really beginning my life with Jesus and my journey with him at that point in time. I was born in Peru and grew up in Brazil. My parents were missionaries there for 35 years. And we were home on furlough one week before my seventh birthday. And while the, the benediction song, you know, at the end of the service was playing, I realized that my missionary parents could not save me and that I needed to personally accept Jesus as my personal savior. And I went forward and then I was baptized like a month later after that. Well, thank you for sharing your, your God story and how the Lord uh, saved you both. I'm curious, uh, how, how did you two come together as, as husband and wife? I, I'm, I'm sure that's a long story, um, but how did God bring you together as husband and wife? Uh, and um, and also uh, your family. Can you just let us know a little bit about your, your kids as well? Okay. Um, it is a long story. <laughs> and um, But uh, we'll try and keep it uh, uh, concise. Uh, as I said, I'm from Alberta, and uh, my wife was uh, born and grew up on the Amazon in Brazil. And so that's a question is how we got together. And um, in 1976, uh, uh, we met each other at an informations conference uh, in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I was uh, stationed uh, in the Canadian Army uh, in uh, Quebec City, and Adelia was down in North Carolina uh, studying nursing, living with her family, we were on furlough. And so uh, we both came out for the missions conference, and uh, it was there that uh, we first met. And then uh, that was the first time and the, the that we uh, met and saw each other and the fourth time we were getting married. And so today, in fact, marks our 43rd anniversary. Wow, congratulations. Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> oh, that's good, and you knew the amount of years, too. So that was <laughs> uh, well, um, My wife reminded me. To your mind, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, well, for some of our newer people who may not know, um, uh, you know, where you served and uh, how long you have served. So if you could just somehow, in, in a couple minutes, uh, give us uh, j just uh, highlight uh, what you have been doing the last many years as a couple, where you have been serving. If, if you could somehow try and do that, that would be great. Okay. Um, for me, the, uh, the missions conference that we met at in 1976, that's really, I I think when God began working my life towards missions, uh, Dealey had been born on the field and grew up uh, with missionary family and really had a heart for that at that point in time. And so um, after we were married, um, I continued my military service and then you know, uh, just sensing the Lord leading us, we have 
apply to uh, Association of Baptists for World Evangelism in 1985, uh, which would be 35 years ago. And uh, they accepted us uh, as missionaries uh, and appointed us to the Gambia and West Africa. And then five years later, in 1990, with our family, with uh, our four children, Heidi, uh, Damien, uh, Elise, and Shauna, uh, we arrived uh, in the Gambia uh, on May the 20th, uh, 1990. And so it's been just about 30 years, wow. just over 30 years that uh, we've had ministry there. Wow, <laughs> that's amazing. Um, when you think back of, of all the years uh, that God has used to you in the, in the Gambia, is there, is there one story or that, that stands out to you uh, of how, um, of, of, of you seeing God working uh, in the Gambia? Is there? Yeah. <laughs> I have several stories. Yes, well, I'm sure, yeah, so, of course. Well, I think the most exciting, <laughs> one of the most exciting ones is that in the Gambia, being a Muslim country, I had the opportunity to teach CRE, Christian Religious Education. And I began in this one school because some of the kids that were Christians were in my ESL class, you know, teaching English and, and helping them and tutoring them and reading. They said, Auntie, we need, a, we need a Christian Religious Education teacher. So I began taught. I taught for two years. And when on Fridays when they went for prayers, the mosque people, we had a praise and worship time. I, I showed them videos of the Jesus and Christmas, and the thing that got me the most was when I showed the Christmas story and a young fellow said, Auntie, I'm a Christian, but I've never heard the whole Christmas story. <laughs> and, and then it got them excited. When we first went to that school, their heads were always down because they were kind of bullied or looked down upon. But anyways, so I taught them through the whole Bible. Um, I condensed their material and got them through it. And I had 46 students. And, and then God kind of took me out of it. And I didn't hear anything. But three years later, I was invited to speak at a camp for the girls. And I learned that eight of those kids that were in that class went back to their local church. And they started youth groups. So there was 124 kids at camp. There was more kids, but they couldn't all make it, okay. you know. But out of those eight kids that went back to their schools, that God did it. And now in that school, when they didn't used to have a teacher, they have four teachers. They have their own room. Every time I had to teach, I had to find a room, set it up. And I used to fix their desk for them. And so... I was really excited how God just used that little bit of training and they took their books because he would, you, you get a choice between IRK, Islamic Religious Study, or CRK, or French. And so most took French because they didn't have a teacher. And by teaching them that, I got enough students interested and the government said you have to have a certain number before they pay for it. But I bought the books because they didn't buy for the Christian kids. So we bought the books, and they paid half, and we paid half. And God used those books when they used it for their youth group. And it's still growing, and it's still going. Amazing. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing. And that, and obviously, very difficult to pick one, but that was uh, great to see the Lord work. Thank you. All right, so well, after 30 years of ministry in the Gambia, you've been back in London now for a few months, and... Uh, but in a couple of weeks, you're moving out east. Down uh, east. Down, down <laughs> east. Down east. Down east. Down east. Okay. <laughs> um, just uh, wondering when you are moving uh, there, and and why are you moving down east? What 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 led to to that decision? So, uh, I look at it as we're just moving further east. <laughs> <laughs> okay, true. That's true. Good call. Good point. <laughs> okay. um, we are looking forward to moving to Moncton, New Brunswick. And uh, we have uh, purchased a house there, and uh, we just thank God for uh, bringing the circumstances together. But we were looking uh, for ministry and for really a, um, what will we do in retirement, um, though we really don't consider things retirement. Uh, we'll officially retire from ABWE at the end of this year, but we're still looking uh, that just one uh, phase of 
ministry and a new phase is beginning. And so we were uh, considering where God would have us to go. And uh, we want uh, to be near one of our children, which is, can be difficult uh, because uh, our son is, Damien's in Nova Scotia, and two of our daughters, Heidi and then Sean, are, are down in North Carolina. And Elise so is in Japan. And yeah, and Elise is in Japan at, at this point <laughs> in time. So uh, Japan was definitely out of the question. <laughs> um, but uh, we decided that uh, uh, to stay in Canada and to uh, try and get as close to Damien as possible. And so uh, that just drew us to look down east. Uh, and um, Plus it was too high here, the uh, prices. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> and uh, so we began looking for housing, and uh, we settled upon uh, Moncton. Uh, that just seemed like a, a good place uh, to, uh, to locate to. It, Moncton is the hub of, uh, of the Maritimes, and it seemed like a really good place uh, for possibilities for ministry. As well as uh, the housing, uh, we quickly learned was uh, much more affordable and uh, and sustainable on our on our retirement income. And so, um, on August the 31st, which is what, about 11 days away, uh, the movers will be coming. And then the next day, on September the 1st, uh, we'll begin driving to towards uh, uh, Moncton. Moncton, okay. And. Uh, uh, we are looking forward to it. Uh, okay. We will miss uh, Stony Creek, we really do. Um, but yet yeah, we're excited about what God has uh, for us there. Okay. And uh, we're looking forward to that, to the next stage in life. Yeah. Uh, we were looking forward to maybe doing international, because I teach English as okay. a second language, or just being a mom and dad to international students, okay. Okay. And, and have open door opportunity. And we didn't know when we located that there's two universities seven minutes away, a oh, Christian wow. one, and, and, uh, and there's a lot of Africans there. Okay, okay. Well, that is that is amazing. Um, now, obviously, much more could be said, but just wondering, kind of in closing, uh, is there anything that we as a church family can be praying for you guys over the next couple weeks or months? And uh, if, you, if you could let us know that. Uh, we appreciate prayer for our transition. Uh, at this point in time, when we get to New Brunswick, we do have to do a quarantine, self-quarantine right, for 14 days. For the second time. <laughs> okay, the second time. Uh, and um, there's still uh, some things uh, for the house uh, to, uh, to still be uh, settled, and uh, all the details come together. Appreciate your prayers for that. And uh, I think particularly for our, our time there as we get located, and uh, that we'd be sensitive to the Lord's leading in terms of ministry. Okay. Uh, we're we're able to do anything that um, uh, capitalizing on our experience and are just trusting the Lord to uh, just direct us. Um, I'll still continue work on my doctor ministry program okay. and hope to complete that within about a year. Okay. And uh, but we are looking forward to uh, potentials there. Okay. So it's, we're, Say it's um, a new adventure that we're okay, going. and we're really close to the airport. So all of you or anybody who comes that way can come and stay with us and save a little bit of money, and it's a way we can repay you. Okay, okay, <laughs> and, and no, and you're welcome. All you, you know, if you get to the airport, just call us. We'll come and get you. Okay, nice. We have four bedrooms and a finished basement. <laughs> okay, well that sounds good. <laughs> uh, Lots to see out there. They tell yes, me. Yes, yes, beautiful out there. That is for sure. Um, well, anyways, well, thank you for uh, just being willing to share with us and uh, certainly thankful. Uh, I'll, I'll speak on behalf of our church family, thankful for uh, your many years of faithfully serving the Lord in the Gambia. And, and of course, knowing you're, you'll continue to serve the Lord uh, in Moncton, New Brunswick and where the Lord leads you. And so yeah. pray for the, our people on the field, because our one missionary needs to get out and the people there's a short termer to cover for our station, okay. but they can't get in. That's a really concern because okay. we only have two single ladies on the field once the other one gets out. Okay, okay. That's a really con big concern. Okay, well, let's let's now, let's pray as a, as a church family. Uh, one of our uh, missions committee members will, will lead us uh, in prayer now. Barney and Adelia, on behalf of the Missions Committee and all the folks at Stony Creek, we thank you for your service to the Gambia, and we're going to miss you guys. And it would be nice if you guys could have stayed here with us, but God has called you to a new location, so we'll be praying for you in that new location. 
Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for Barney and Adelia, Father, and the desire that you gave them to be missionaries, Father, and to call them to the Gambia. We pray for their ministry, Father, that they have left behind, for the seeds that were sown in the Gambia, Father, that you would nourish them and make them grow, Father, and bring them to maturity so that they, too, may continue to spread the name of Jesus Christ, Father. We pray also for the Reed family, Patrick and Michelle, and their three children as they are still preparing to go out to the Gambia, Father, that you would continue to raise their funds and make all the provisions that they need so that they too may go out there and continue the ministry that Barney and Adelia have started, Father. And in this new stage of life that you are putting Barney and Adelia into in Moncton, Father, we pray for the opportunities that they are looking for there to serve you as well, Father, and to continue to spread the name of Jesus in the area that they are going to, Father. Thank you for continuing to use their lives to bring folks to know and to come to a, a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, Father. We thank you so much for the opportunities that you have given us as a church to serving and supporting our missionaries, Father. We ask that you continue to do these things. We ask all these things in Jesus' precious name. I want to thank uh, Marla for leading us in those songs, and then Pastor Andy and the Robisons for that interview, and then Emily for recording that as well. It was uh, exciting to hear some of what God has done in your many years serving in the Gambia, and we celebrate with you your retirement today. Uh, just a couple of updates as we get going here. I uh, just want to remind you that on September the 6th, so the first Sunday of September, uh, we're going to move our service time to 10 a.m. So that will be for both in-person and church online. So those of you who are joining us online right now, at, on September the 6th, uh, join us a half an hour earlier. So 10 o'clock is when the time will start. So next week will be the last week we have a 1030 service. Uh, I want to let you know as well that our fall ministries, particularly our ministry leaders, have been working hard to try to figure out how they could possibly do ministry in the midst of this kind of global pandemic we find ourselves in. And I'm excited to let you know that our seniors are going to move forward with an outdoor concert with the chaplairs. And there is uh, information about that in the weekly email that was sent out this past week. It will be in this coming uh, weeks as well. Registration is required for that just by contacting the office. So please make sure you do that if you're interested in going to that outdoor concert. Uh, if you're not getting those weekly emails, I, I'd encourage you to go to our website, stonycreekbaptist.com, and there's a, a spot you can sign up for that weekly brief uh, newsletter right on that first page. And so you can put in your email, and then you'll get that email weekly with all of the updates. And there's a number of things that will be coming up for the fall, and so I'd encourage you to be watching those emails for that. I also just wanted to let you know, because I have had some questions about a few different things in regards to September and our Sunday services, uh, we are going to go back to doing Church Family Stories of God at Work each week. We took a break just for August with communion each week and with our outdoor services, but we'll be going back to those in September. And then our kids' verses as well. So if you kids want to keep saying verses for that countdown, please, uh, parents, record them, send them to me. I have a number from David Jr. in Nigeria that, uh, that they've been sending me still. So we're going to include some of those in September as well and love to include some of uh, you kids as well, some of the other kids that are joining with us to, to include those in that countdown. And then uh, we're also going to have part of our service in September that's going to be geared to our kids as well. And so you can kind of look forward to that, still kind of tweaking and, and what that's going to look like. But we're excited for that component. All right, I want to invite you to open your Bibles to 1 John. We are continuing our series called Let There Be Joy. And we're studying today chapter 3, verses, eight, uh, verses 11 to 18. And we're going to be talking today what it means to love like Jesus. So let me pray as we get going. Father, we are grateful today for the opportunity now to study your word together. I pray that your spirit would speak to us through your word, convict us where that is needed, encourage us where that is needed, and may we be spurred by your Holy Spirit to love like Jesus. We pray these things in his name. Amen. Amen. So one of my favorite stories in the Bible is the story of Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus, who was a wee little man, a wee little man was he climbed up a sycamore tree because the Lord he wanted to see. Maybe some of you know that song that I used to sing as a kid as well. 
Uh, Zacchaeus was a tax collector, and so he was hated. He was hated by his own people because he was a traitor. To the Jewish people, he sold them out by collecting taxes for Rome, so collecting taxes for the enemy. And in fact, just a quick note on that, there's a, a TV series out called The Chosen, and uh, it's one of the few series that I've actually binge-watched. Uh, I haven't done that with too many shows, but that was one of them. But that series does a fantastic, and all the, all the episodes are available on YouTube, by the way. You can watch them for free, and I encourage you to check them out. One of the things that was really fascinating was um, depicting the context and the culture of what it would have been like for a tax collector. And they do it through the eyes and the life of Matthew, who was a tax collector who became one of the disciples. They do a fantastic job of setting the context of what it was like to be a tax collector and how hated Matthew would have been. Zacchaeus was also a tax collector. And he was a a man who, he heard Jesus was coming to town and he wanted to see him. Something about Jesus coming piqued his interest and so he wanted to just get a glimpse of, of Jesus. And so he, he knows he can't join the crowd. If he joins the crowd, he, he's, a, he's a man small of stature. That's where that wee little man comes from in the song. He's a man small of stature. And so if he joins in the crowd to try to see Jesus, this is a crowd that hates him. They know who he is. And so just a quick jab of the knife and he would be dead. And well, who did it? I don't know who did it. That kind of idea. So his life would be at risk if he just joined the crowd. And so what Zacchaeus does, and Luke 19 tells the story, Zacchaeus runs on ahead outside of the city to a sycamore tree. And the reason I say it's outside the city is because there were rules as to how far a sycamore tree had to be outside of a city. A sycamore tree couldn't be inside a city. So that detail tells us that Zacchaeus went outside of the city and climbed up this sycamore tree along the path where Jesus would have been walking through as he would be leaving the city. And he was likely hoping by doing that that there would be less of a crowd with Jesus by the time he got outside of the city. And on, on, on top of that, um, he would have known that uh, his life would have been at risk if people spotted him. And on top of that, I mean, it would have been an incredible shameful thing if he was caught having climbed a tree. As a dignified man like Zacchaeus, he wouldn't have climbed a tree. Little boys are, are those who climb trees, not dignified men like Zacchaeus. So Zacchaeus risked shame in order to just get a glimpse of Jesus. And I think many of you know the story. As Jesus is leaving the city, he's walking by this sycamore tree. He sees Zacchaeus and he says, Zacchaeus, come down. And you can just imagine the crowd at that moment who was still there. Because the, the, Luke 19 talks about the crowd that is still there. You can just imagine the uh, kind of anticipation. This is Jesus who's going to teach this tax collector sinner a lesson. He, he's going to shame him for what he's done and make an example of him and ridicule him. Whatever it might be, he's going to make an example of Zacchaeus. And so you can almost sense this anticipation of the crowd as Zacchaeus is climbing down from the tree. But instead, Jesus doesn't shame him. Jesus responds and says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today for tea and biscuits or whatever they, whatever they had. The song says they had tea. I don't know what they had, but Jesus invited himself over to Zacchaeus' house. Now, I know that sounds weird. It would be weird if I came up to you and said, hey, I'm coming to your house today. You'd be like, no, you're not. But for in this context, and this is Jesus who's talking here, this would have been an incredible privilege and honor that Jesus was inviting himself over to Zacchaeus' house. Now, follow what happened here a little bit. Zacchaeus would have been shamed by the crowds. The crowds would have seen him. They would have snickered. Look at this dignified man who climbed a tree. Zacchaeus was one who deserved the anger of the crowd toward him. He deserved to to, to be taught a lesson by Jesus and to be shamed. But Jesus doesn't give him what he deserves. Instead, he loves him. He invites himself over to his house. And as soon as he does that, The anger of the crowd towards Zacchaeus shifts to Jesus. Luke 19 describes this, that the anger of the crowd that was directed towards Zacchaeus now shifts to Jesus, and they're angry at him. How could you, Jesus, a a holy man, go to the house of a sinner tax collector like Zacchaeus? So the anger that Zacchaeus deserved, Jesus 
took on himself. Now, why would he do that? Because that's what love does. Love puts the interests of others ahead of yourself. And the response to Jesus spending time with Zacchaeus, we have no idea how long he spent with Zacchaeus, but the response of Jesus, uh, of Zacchaeus after spending some time with Jesus is his heart is transformed. Jesus says salvation has come to this house. And the outflow of that was Zacchaeus paid back four times what he stole from anyone. Everyone that he stole from, he didn't just pay it back, he paid it back four times, Luke 19 says. The law required him to simply pay it back, but he paid it back four times the amount. Now, why would he do that? Because that's what love does. Love puts the interests of others ahead of yourself. And when the love of Jesus, when you experience that, and that transforms your heart, the natural response is to love others like this. The natural response is to love others in a sacrificial and abundant way way. So today we're talking about loving like Jesus, and that was a great story to kind of lead into this passage, I thought. And some of the questions I want to be answering today that we're going to see John answering is, how do we know what love is? Who's our example of love, and what does it look like for you and me to love like our example, love like Jesus? And we saw last week that one of the marks of a believer a genuine believer was brotherly love. He kind of just set that up last week, that someone with a heart for God is going to have a heart for people. The two go hand in hand. And today we're going to see John explaining to us what that looks like. And he's going to do so in a very practical and tangible way on what it looks like to love like Jesus. So let's look at the passage together. First John 3, starting in verse 11. John writes this, For this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. So right away, we know there's nothing new about this message that John is teaching. He's not saying, hey, I got this new teaching for you. He's saying, this is the message you heard from the very beginning, when you first became a follower of Jesus, when you first gave your life to Christ, and you heard you need to love one another. This is the same message that I am talking about now. And that, that's a good reminder. And you think, well, we really need to be reminded of that. But sometimes we can talk so much about kind of having a personal relationship with Jesus, that it just becomes about you and Jesus and no one else. But how you treat others matters immensely to God. And in fact, what John is saying here is it's evidence of whether or not you even know God to begin with, whether or not you love. Verse 12 goes on. He says, We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. So it's jealousy that kind of was behind Cain killing Abel. It, it was behind his hatred towards Abel. It was, it was jealousy and envy. And, and maybe you can think, well, I, I've never killed anyone like Cain did. Or I don't even have a temptation to kill, like actual murder someone. But before you let yourself off the hook just too quickly there, remember what Jesus said. That if you harbor kind of unrighteous anger towards someone else, towards a brother or sister, it's like you're murdering them in your heart. So don't be too quick to dismiss the challenge here that we are being given. And you can see what John is doing here. He's using contrast to make a point, to explain one thing. So if I were to explain to you what a male is, I would maybe contrast it with a female and be able to explain what a male is. Or if I were to want to explain to you what tall meant, I would have a tall person beside a short person. I can explain it that way. And that's what John is doing here with love. He's contrasting love and hate. He's showing us what it looks like to love others by giving us a picture of the opposite of what it looks like to hate someone else and what drives someone to hate someone like that. And he carries that on in verse 13. He says, don't be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. Same, which about the same verse that he uh, said that we studied last week. Don't be surprised, brothers, and the world doesn't understand. Don't be surprised when they hate you. Verse 14, we know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. So everyone who hates his brother, John says flat out here, he is a murderer. 
It's evidence that he or she does not know Jesus. Evidence that he or she does not have eternal life abiding in them, he says. And though th- these verses, they, they give an incredible picture of regeneration. John talks about the kind of big theological concepts of salvation without using those exact terms, but he talks about them here, and he describes here what it means to be born again. He says, we know that we have passed, talking to believers here, we know that we have passed out of death into life. So to be born again is to pass from death to life. We were dead in our sins, the Bible says. We were dead in our trespasses and our sins, Ephesians says. And when you are dead in anything, you're dead. If you're dead, there's nothing you can do to change your deadness because you're dead. You need something from the outside if anything is ever possibly going to change. But when you're dead, you can't change the fact that you are dead. And so the scriptures say that while we were dead in our sins and we were helpless in that, God sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. And he was raised from the dead. And we too are made alive together with Christ. That God made us alive together with him when we were dead in our sins. So at the moment of your salvation, you were brought from death to life is how John describes it here. And the outflow of that life is love, is love for your brother. And John says, if you don't love your brother, that's evidence that you abide in death. You don't abide in Christ. Because if you abided in Christ, you would love your brother. Look what he writes in verse 16. We talk a lot about John 3.16, but 1 John 3.16 is just as incredible. Verse 16, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brother. So our example of love is who? It's Christ. If you want to know what love is, look at Christ. If you want to compare yourself with anyone to see if you are a loving person, person, don't compare yourself with someone else. We are so good at comparing ourselves with the worst of people to feel better about ourselves. Instead, look to Christ. Compare your love with Christ's love who laid down his life for us. Don't look at what the world calls as love and follow that. Colossians 3 talks about letting the love of Christ rule your hearts. What that means is we don't let what we think we deserve rule our hearts. We don't let what is for our pleasure on this earth rule our hearts. We let Christ rule our hearts. Our example of love and how we love is Christ. It's Christ who put our interests ahead of his own by laying down his life for us. In all of our relationships, every relationship we have should be a reflection of that love. If you are married, your marriage, the way you love your spouse should be a reflection of the way in which Christ has loved us. If you are not loving your spouse in the way that Christ has loved you, there's an issue there. There's a problem there. Every relationship we have ought to be a reflection of Christ's love with friends, family, with neighbors. With the love like Christ loves, putting the interests of others ahead of our own. And and notice the wording in verse 16 as well. The wording in verse 16 says, He laid down His life for us. This is significant. This is telling us that Jesus was not a victim, that Jesus was not helpless on the cross as He hung there with nails in His hands and feet, but He laid down His life. He voluntarily did this for us. He, He laid down His life means that he had full control the entire time. He could have stopped at any moment. Any moment on that tree, on that cross, he could have thought of his own interests ahead of our own and stopped the entire thing. He was in full control, but instead he didn't. And in love, he put our interests ahead of his own as he laid down his life, as he gave up his life for you and for me, that we could know eternal life through him. This is what love does lays down his life for others. And that's what John says, that's what love looks like. This is how we love others. We have to love others in the same way. Just as Christ loved us in this way, so we ought to, there's an oughtness there, so we ought to love one another in the same way. 
the evidence of a genuine Christian is that he or she loves as Jesus loves. That he or she willingly and voluntarily and sacrificially loves others the way that Jesus did when he laid down his life for us. There's no such thing, John says, as a Christian who does not love like this. If someone who professes Christ doesn't love like this, it's evidence, John says, that they have not passed from death to life. Their heart has not been regenerated and transformed by the Holy Spirit. Now, you may be responding by saying, well, how can I love like Christ loves? And that's a legitimate question. Uh, He laid down his life on the cross. Uh, My guess is, is that there is no one that's joined with us this morning who is going to have to show their love for someone else by being crucified to a Roman cross. Uh, There's probably no one who's going to have to kind of love someone in such such a dramatic way as giving up literally your life for the sake of someone else being nailed to a cross. And so John's response is, is this response in verse 17. When you see someone who's in need and you meet that need, that's following the example of Christ's love. Verse 17, but if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, now world's goods is talking about that which is needed for life. So talking about the basic necessities of life, talking about water, food, clothing, something that someone needs to survive. If you have the world's goods, something that someone needs to survive, and they are in need, they don't have it, they can't survive without it, yet you close your heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? How does God's love abide in you if you close your heart? So don't miss what John is saying here. See, the contrast that he's making here is that Jesus, our master, the one we follow, the one who we abide with and who abides with us, he willingly laid down his life for us. And yet the person in verse 17 that John is talking about isn't even willing to lay, a, to lay down some of his earthly possessions, his material possessions for the sake of someone else. And, and he has in view here in particular other believers. You notice the family language that John is using. Brothers, sisters in Christ, it's family language. Jesus laid down his life for us. How can you then see a fellow believer who's in need? And turn a blind eye. and Do nothing about it. What does it say about us if we won't even sacrifice some of our material possessions for the good of others, for the sake of others, the welfare of others? What does that say about us? Jesus, our master, who was willing to lay down his life for us, yet you're not, we're not willing to sacrifice that which already belongs to him anyway that he's entrusted to us here on this earth. We're not willing to even sacrifice some of that for the sake of others. What does that say about us? There's a caution here, kind of a warning against indifference, against walking on the other side of the road when you see someone in need. When you, like in the, sto- in the parable of the Good Samaritan, like the religious people did, they saw the need and then just walked on the other side. It was too risky wasn't convenient, so they walked on the other side of the road, ignoring the man who was beaten, just left him for dead. For those that have had the love of God change them from the inside out, been brought from death to life, you willingly lay down your life for the sake of others. You willingly offer what has been entrusted to you for the sake of the welfare and the good of others. You're not driven by convenience or safety. As children of God, we can never be driven by safety or convenience or comfort in this world. There's a draw to that, a temptation to to, to, to move there. But we cannot be driven by convenience and safety. We need to be driven by love at whatever the cost. To love others in the name of Christ as we share the hope of Christ with them. We need to be driven not by safety, not by fear, but by love. And I want you to notice as well that there's a change in the language from verses 16 to 17. And it's deliberate. It moves from plural to singular. And it helps make the duty of us as brothers and sisters kind of more tangible. It's more individualized, I should say, as it moves from plural to singular. It's not like he's saying that we need to go and practically love 
all of you know, capital H humanity, all of humanity, you need to go and personally know and love them. Or everyone in the church worldwide, you need to go know them and love them and meet their need. It's not what he's saying. You ever kind of heard that excuse before? Well, we can't love everyone, so should we even bother helping anyone? Loving everybody in general is an excuse we can sometimes use for loving nobody in particular. And there's this caution, this guarding against this that John is saying to us, that we can't use that as an excuse, this attitude that he's cautioning us against of saying, well, can't love everyone, can't do everything, and then allowing that to move you to inaction, to doing nothing then. You probably know the story of the starfish. It's story that's been told for many, many years. The old man who's throwing starfish into the ocean. There's thousands of starfish lined on the beach. He picks one up. He throws it in the ocean. Save that little starfish's life. That young man comes to him and says, what are you doing, man? Why do you even bother? Even if you work all day, your efforts aren't going to make a difference. There's thousands of starfish here. And the old man looks at him, simply picks up another starfish, throws it in the ocean, says, well, it mattered to that one. And it's just the kind of reminder. That we're not expected to be kind of involved in practically loving every single person in this world, but we ought to be sacrificially loving the people that we are able to, the people that we can, knowing that it will make a difference one person at a time. And this phrase that he uses here in this verse 17, that closes his heart, means to shut off compassion. It's actually uh, an image of a door being slammed in someone's face. So imagine that there is a fellow believer who's in need. They're standing at your front door. To do nothing about it is to like slam the door in his face. You lock the door, you put a wall in front of you, throw away the key. You continue on with your own little world like it's all about you, just ignoring that there are any needs out there at all. It's kind of the picture that we are being given here, that you just shut people out of your life who are in need. You don't want to be bothered by them. You don't want to be inconvenienced by them. You make excuses for inaction, which we are so great at doing. We make excuses for why we don't need to do anything leads us to inaction because of these excuses. And if that's what you do, John says, how can the love of God abide in you? You shut the door to someone in need. You throw away the key. You build your own little life in this bubble. How can the love of God abide in you? And John says, it can't. That if you don't love like this, it's evidence that God does not abide in you. That you don't abide in Him. If that's our response to slam the door, or to turn a blind eye to those who are suffering around the world, to be indifferent towards that. It's evidence that we don't really know Him, that our heart hasn't been transformed by the power of the Holy Spirit. So the exhortation He gives us here is in verse 18. Little children, a concluding statement here. Let us then love in word. Let us not love in word and talk, but in deed and in truth. So to love in truth means that our love is guided by the Word of God, that there are confines of our love and it's directed by the Word of God. So our love is always in line with the Word of God. But then at the same time, we love in deed, he says. Actions speak louder than words. I know you've heard that before. Let us love not just with our words. So we are to love with our words too. The idea here that's being given to us is our works and our words should preach the same thing. It should be consistent. There should be no inconsistency between what we say and how we live. They should be preaching the same message. So this is a call by John to the church to let Christ-like love be your lifestyle, be your way of life, that in order for love to be genuine, we're going to seek the welfare of others. We're going to seek the good of others just as Christ did for us. Love doesn't turn a blind eye. Love doesn't slam the door to those in need. Love doesn't build up a wall around your life to kind of keep the undesirables out. But love compels us to act. Love compels us to put the interests of others 
ahead of ourselves. Love compels us not to just sit back, but to actually do something in response to the needs around the world. It's love that compels a believer to share the gospel. It's love that, that, that compels missionaries to go to the hardest, most dangerous places around the world to share the gospel because their priority isn't safety. Love is their priority. Loving them by sharing the good news of Christ to a people who are headed to a Christless eternity apart from Him. So the most loving thing you can do is to go to these hardest, most dangerous places in the world and share the good news of the gospel with them. Don't let comfort be your priority. We let love be our priority. It's love that compels a believer to get involved in rescuing women and kids from being trafficked, even right here in the city. It's love that compels us to foster and adopt kids who are in need in the city. It's love that compels many in our church family to reach out to their neighbors in these days of pandemic and offer to do whatever needs to be done, to help them in what needs to be done, especially the elderly who live around you. It's love that compels you to be the hands and feet of Christ and helping them in whatever they need. It's love that compels many of you, I know, to serve in arcade, to serve in seniors' homes, to serve, to, to serve in homeless and youth organizations right here in the city that are working in gospel work. You could be spending time kind of on yourself and your own pleasure and doing your own thing, but instead you sacrifice your time and your effort to love as Jesus does. It's what compels you. It's love that compelled the Robisons to go to the Gambia in the first place. I know the Robisons enough to know that it was love that led them to leave the comforts of North America to share the love and hope of Christ with the Gambian people, to commit their lives to doing that. It's love that's compelling the Westons to go back to Togo. It's love that compels us to do good works for the sake of the gospel. The love of Christ compels us to act in love. To not make safety or comfort or convenience our priority. To not be indifferent to needs that we are able to meet or turn a blind eye to needs that we are able to meet. But the love of Christ compels us to do something about it. Put love into action even when it costs us something. The love of Christ shown to us on the cross cost us, cost him his life. It was sacrificial love for our good. And so a good follow-up question from what we're seeing here in this passage is this. What am I sacrificing right now in order to love others? What am I sacrificing? How am I loving sacrificially? How am I giving right now in a sacrificial way? How am I giving of the, my resources and of my life for the welfare of others, both today and for all eternity. Let me just close by asking you or kind of throwing out some questions. Is there someone in our church right now who you know is hurting that you could come alongside and love like Jesus loves them? And love like Jesus loved you. Is there someone who's hurting you can come alongside right now? Is there someone right now in our church family who's carrying a burden that is too heavy for them to carry alone that you can come alongside and bear that burden with them? That's loving like Christ loves. Is there someone who right now could use a kind word or a porch visit or a phone call or an email or text, whatever it might be, to love them today? There's someone in our church you can do that right now. Is it time for maybe your family to open itself, your home, to, to kids in need right here in this city? Perhaps it's time for, for you to let that holy discontent that you have been experiencing for a long time to move you to action, to move you to get involved in a, in a gospel cause that God has laid on your heart. Are there things in your life right now that you are spending money on that aren't necessary that you could be using to help others in their need or using to invest in missionaries who are taking the gospel to the ends of the earth? Missionaries like the Westons who are preparing right now to go to Togo. 
My prayer for us as a church family is that we would love sacrificially and give sacrificially until it hurts. It's the way of Jesus. So I would pray that we don't sit idly by, but that we roll up our sleeves and and let's together love in the way that Christ has loved us, not just in words, but in actions, in deed. I pray that our words that we preach and the lives that we live will say the same thing, will preach the same message. This is my prayer for us as a church family. Let us love like Jesus loved us. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the challenges in it. I thank you for the reminders in it of what Christ has done for us in the passage that we have just looked at today. That we can know what love is by looking at your son, Jesus, and what he did for us on the cross. And I pray that that would propel us to love others in the same way. That we would have a heart for you and that would lead us to have a heart for others. That we would be a church family that loves and gives sacrificially in the best interests of others, both today and for all eternity. May we give our lives for the sake of Christ, loving others, and that others would know the love of Christ that we know. May we give our lives to that, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are going to do communion now. And so I'd encourage you, if you're at home, to go gather your uh, juice and your bread. And uh, we're going to come around the table together. Jesus, when he was with his disciples, he took bread and he said to his disciples, this is my body given for you. And like right here what we see in 1 John 3.16, that this is, this is what love is, that Jesus laid down his life for us. And this is what we remember when we come to the communion table And when we remember, the idea of remembering is not just to reflect on and think about that, but to ask God, are we living in light of these truths that we are remembering? Are we living in such a way that our lives reflect the truth that Jesus laid down his life for us and we ought to love others? Are we loving in that way? That's part of what it means to come to the table and remember what Christ did for us. So I'm going to I give you just a little bit of time right now in case you need to gather those elements at home. And uh, if you have them already, just to spend some time in quiet reflection before the Lord. Are you living in a way that is consistent to this? Are there things in your life that you need to confess to the Lord and ask Him to bring you back on to the right path? So spend some time in reflection for just a couple of, uh, just a little bit of time now. And then I will come back up and lead us in taking the bread together. Jesus took the bread with his disciples and he said, this is my body given for you. The next day his body would be beaten, would be tortured, would be nailed to a cross and he would die on the cross, a death that we deserve. He would die in our place that we could be forgiven, that we could have a heart that would be cleansed, that we could be brought from death to life. So Jesus, with this bread, he said, this is my body given for you. Eat this in remembrance of me, and so let us together do the same right now.
In the same way, Jesus took the cup and he said, this is my blood shed for you. The next day, nails would pierce his hands and his feet and his blood would pour out and that blood would be shed so that your heart could be cleansed, so that you could be forgiven, so that you could be set free. And he pointed to this and said, this cup represents my blood shed for you that you could have eternal life. He said, drink this in remembrance of me and so let us together do the same. The scriptures say every time we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. And it's a good time to remember that there is a day coming when Christ will return, make all things new. And so let's live in light of that day by loving others as Christ has loved us. Let me pray, and then we're going to sing a closing song, and then I'll come back up and close our service together. Let me pray. Father, thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, and what he accomplished for us on the cross. And I pray, Father, that if there is anyone who's joining us this morning who does not know eternal life, that does not have a relationship with your Son, Jesus Christ, does not know what it means to have your sins forgiven. I pray that today, Father, this would be the day that they confess by faith their need of Christ and give their lives to Him. We are so grateful that we can celebrate this today, all that Christ has done for us, and may we live in light of His return when the King of all kings returns makes all things new. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. To respond, we're going to sing a song that might be new to some of you, but it is really easy to pick up, and the words are so powerful that we wanted to make sure um, you had this in your repertoire. So please sing with us as you pick it up. In the darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt Rose from their tombs and the angels. St- 
Thank you, Marla, for uh, leading us in that closing song. What a great song to end our service with today. Uh, If you're joining with us online, let me encourage you as the Robisons prepare for their retirement, if you want to just write a little message to them in the chat box over here, a little note of encouragement, a little note of blessing to them, let them know that you are praying for them. I know they would be encouraged by that. We'll pass those along to them. So keep praying for them as they make this transition and move at the end of this month. So we celebrate with them their retirement and thank you Barney and Adelia for uh, doing this interview uh, that we show, showed earlier and uh, so grateful for all that God has done through you guys in your time in the Gambia. And so we celebrate all of that with you. Uh, I also want to let you know on a personal note, my wife and I, we have baby number six coming uh, next weekend is the plan, uh, uh, the birth mother of our two youngest kids that we have adopted. Uh, she is going to be induced next weekend. And so uh, I'm going to be away for a little while once that happens with uh, watching the other five at home being dad there. And so uh, Pastor Andy's going to be preaching for the next number of weeks. And I'm uh, very excited for that and uh, excited to be uh, able to join online at home uh, and sit under his preaching for those times. So just wanted to make you aware of that. And then uh, as well, I encourage you, if you're uh, ready to come out in person, uh, you can register to come next week uh, online uh, just by going to our website, stonycreekbaptist.com. And a reminder, we have a baptism service next week as well. And excited for that. So if you have uh, professed faith in Christ, you've given your life to Christ, but you've not yet been baptized Get in touch with us. We'd love to include you in that service next week. All right, my benediction for you today is out of Psalm 67, a great mission psalm that also speaks out of uh, what we've studied here today. May God bless us and be gracious to us. May he make his face shine upon us that his way may be known on earth and his saving power among all nations. It's my prayer for us as a church. May that be so through us. Have a great week. We'll see you next week. God bless.